Alright guys, how's it going? My most recent look at Intel, this video, the state of Intel's 10 nanometers, mostly went over some manufacturing slides from what was a much larger series of presentations during their investor meeting held back in May this year. To be blunt, focusing on the negatives at Intel is an easy thing to do, as they reel from one disaster after another, but it's also important to maintain an element of realism when discussing their future. So for this video, I'll be taking a look at Intel's game plan and what it could mean for us all. And let's start by taking a look at their CEO, Bob Swan's presentation back at the investor meeting. Delivering on the present and creating the future. As an investor meeting, it's obviously very focused on financials, and Bob's presentation starts off with this executive summary, noting how Intel has expanded their total addressable market, and how they've accelerated. Accelerated is a word that Intel uses a lot. Their transformation to a data-centric company. And below that we see the intention is to extend product leadership advantage from CPU to XPU. And I will discuss this at more length later on. And these next couple of slides I found interesting. What Intel said were their top priorities for 2017 and what they expect to deliver. 9 billion revenue increase in the data center since 2016. That is a huge chunk of money. Around 50% higher than AMD's yearly revenue for all of their products. For me though, the telling thing was this PC-centric part where Intel boasts of record profitability in a declining market. If there's one thing I do not like to see, it's companies bragging about making more money while the PC declines. We know that Intel has barely been able to supply the market for the past two years, yet they still made record profits. This should ring everyone's alarm bells, from consumers to the OEMs, motherboard guys, anyone who is involved in the PC that isn't Intel, basically. So next up, they're talking about an opportunity to lead one of the most successful transformations in corporate history. Transformation is a strong word, and they didn't colour it yellow for no reason either. But this transformation will not be easy. Over the page, and finally, we're on to some kind of strategy guide or game plan. The first point, make the world's best semiconductors. Making the world's best semiconductors was easy for Intel in the past, while they held a large manufacturing process lead. Today, however, it's a completely different arena. And the second point, right now, it's safe to say that Intel is nowhere near leading in AI, 5G or autonomous today, but at least they plan to be. Point three was pretty telling, leading end-to-end -end platform provider for the new data world. And I'll also discuss this later along with their transformation from CPU to XPU. And what a slide this is. Intel claims that from 2013 on to 2017 that they were PC-centric company. Certainly, during that time, they made a lot of money by selling quad cores with ever-decreasing die sizes that were maybe around 5-10% to faster than the previous generation. From 2017 and lasting until 2021, which is a date worth noting, we just saw that they made a lot of money in the data center. But all of that is going to pale into insignificance after 2021, when Intel's ambition is to power the world. Over time, we see how Intel's growth has changed and how it will change in the future, clearly with less emphasis on the PC and more and more on their data-centric businesses. Here's another slide which possibly betrays a future strategy, talking about how compute, storage and network demand will grow over the coming years. And again, over the next page, we see that Intel, who used to be a PC and server CPU company with extremely dominant market share in both, which meant that they had limited opportunity to grow. They now intend to be something far more than that. And this is a great slide as it really shows just how much more than a CPU company Intel actually is. With AI, FPGAs, Optane, 5G, etc. And of course, right at the end now, it's worth remembering that in the PC market, they are about to enter the graphics arena too. But having this large addressable market and all of these products is all well and good. But without a said game plan, you may as well just throw these products out the window. Over the page, we learn that Intel does have a game plan and this plan of attack is all about redefining what Intel inside means. And a few slides later, we learn that is the XPU. 
inside of everything. When I look at this slide, I wonder why nobody that I am aware of, at least, has really talked about it at any length. As I just said, old Intel inside was CPU inside of a PC and a server. We can see the PC and the server icons. This new Intel inside is XPU inside of everything. And as we can see, it also includes PC and server. You see the exact same icons. But what is this XPU? Well, next up was Murphy Rendu Chintala and his presentation gave us some clues early on with this slide, the six pillars of innovation. You remember the humorous six pillars of innovation which we saw in that leaked article from Intel's intranet? I discussed those in this video, the Intel challenge. And in that article, we had these six pillars. Process, architecture, memory, interconnect. The humorous part was security, of course. And then finally, software. In the Investor Day presentation, we see XPU architectures being mentioned. And again, on the next slide, along with this description, data-centric workloads require scalar, vector, matrix, and spatial compute, XPUs. Now, your classic CPU generally does scalar work. GPUs do vector. Tensor cores, that kind of thing, are doing matrix, and spatial is done on FPGAs. And in fact, if we skip forward to Navin Shinoy, who is the executive VP and GM of Intel's data center group, his presentation has this slide, from CPU to XPU, showing us what that means. And again, it's the Xeon doing scalar, Intel's X to the power of E discrete graphics doing vector. When they acquired the FPGA company Altera for a huge amount of money, almost $17 billion, they essentially did it for the spatial technology. And again, when they acquired Mobileye for just over $15 billion, and also Movidius and Nirvana for around $400 million each. That was all about matrix computing, deep learning, AI, and inference. So that's what the XPU is all about. And Intel's game plan is transforming the company, redefining Intel inside from this CPU to XPU. And this slide clearly shows that they intend to do so in PC as well. But what does this really mean? Is this XPU one package with all of these different IPs? It's kind of, but not quite. Let's go back to Intel's Architecture Day last December, covered by Anantech, among others. And one of Intel's announcements back then was around their Foveros 3D packaging technology. And they demoed this chip, which had these four small atom cores and one big Sunny Cove core. And at the end of this article, Ian noted that Intel said the reason why this product came about is because a customer asked for a product of about this performance, but with a two milliwatt standby power state. And in order to do this, Intel created and enhanced a number of technologies inside the company, with the final product being apparently ideal for the customer. We learned a few months later that this product was called Lakefield. And only a couple of days ago, we learned that the customer was Microsoft with the Lakefield CPU announced in their new Surface Neo. We also saw Lakefield in Murthy's Investor Day presentation. This Lakefield package containing all of the six pillars, including XPU architectures. Now, Lakefield is an interesting CPU and it looks to be well engineered. This Foveros packaging is really all about stacking as much silicon in as little a uh, physical area as possible. And so this bottom layer, the base of the Lakefield CPU, is an I.O. die. And according to the Intel video, it includes cache as well. However, I haven't seen any evidence of cache in any slides that I've seen. And above this base I.O. die is the compute die, with the aforementioned four small and one big core as well as the integrated graphics. And we can also see that there is two meg of cache on the compute die. And both of these dies, the compute and the base die, are attached face to face with this scalable 3D silicon interconnect, which Intel calls Foveros. What's interesting about this perhaps is the IO layer, the base layer is on 14 nanometers, while the compute layer is 10 nanometers which is actually quite similar to Zen 2, in fact, with its 14 and 12 nanometer I.O. die and 7 nanometer compute dies. And at the top of the whole package is either 4 gigabytes of DRAM or 8 gigabytes of low power DDR4X. 
Stacking dies like this on top of each other has an obvious advantage in area, which allows for much smaller form factors. But it also comes with a few drawbacks, most of which are based around power and thermals. The base die, the I.O. die, is therefore low power. Regarding the compute die, from Intel's own benchmarks, we see that, in multi-threading at least, four Atom cores perform similarly to what two of these Sunny Cove, the big core, would perform. But again, at lower power, under what Intel calls realistic workloads, at least. And at the Hot Chips conference a few weeks ago, again over at Anantech, Ian asked some probing questions of the Lakefield engineers, including, can you scale to higher power with, like, a discrete GPU on top? The answer to that being, we don't see power limits. We think it will span the entire range of the spectrum. And then next up was, can you stack more dies? The answer to which was, there should be no limit. The challenge here though is about cooling the dies underneath, not actually the top layer, which is the easiest part to cool. And therefore, yes, for sure you could put a GPU on top instead of this DRAM. Or you could even put four more of these Sunny Cove cores on the top, as they will be directly attached to the cooling system. The problem though is if you had, say, four of these large Sunny Cove cores and then a GPU stacked on top of each other, how do you cool both of those? Intel says that the Lakefield CPU cores can burst to 27 watts when high performance and demanding workloads are required. 27 watts burst is a long, long way from, say, 150 watts plus sustained CPU load that is typical of perhaps a server CPU. Well, these days, even an Intel desktop CPU. And so if you imagine an eight big core compute die, and then rather than sticking DRAM on top, you've got another 200 to 300 watt GPU on top of it, it will simply be a meltdown with any currently known technology. But that's not to say that it couldn't be done. It's just that we haven't seen it done yet, as far as I'm aware. AMD did allude to this kind of full 3D stacking not being an unsolvable problem. And that was a couple of years ago at the IEDM 2017. Back then, Wikichip noted that it goes without saying that there are serious problems with those solutions, such as heat dissipation and cooling. But following Lisa Su's speech, when an attendee from NVIDIA asked her about the heat problem, Lisa responded by saying she believes many of these problems can be solved or mitigated with clever designs. We could see one of those clever designs when we hear more about Zen 3, Milan, or possibly Genoa and Zen 4. But that's AMD. What about Intel? A slide that I used in the recent Intel video was this one, Process Technology and Packaging. On the left, we have traditional monolithic integration under PC-centric, noting that all PC-centric products will have a one process design point. And on the right, under data-centric, zooming in, we see this XPU. And the slide notes a new type of multi-chip integration with multiple manufacturing processes used depending on the IP, which we know from this slide can be either a Xeon, X to the power of E graphics, Agile X and Stratix FPGAs, and then all of this matrix stuff that Intel recently acquired. Now, I'm going to go back to this slide again, though, and point out that this doesn't really appear to agree with this one. We see Intel inside, which was CPU inside of a PC and server. And this was supposed to become an XPU. We can see the identical icons, the server and the PC. And this wording, XPU platforms inside everything, is unambiguous. However, in this slide, it does look like the PC-centric stuff, all PC products, which would include their new discrete graphics, will remain as they are, a monolithic one-process design. I'm not entirely sure what this is all about, other than possibly this slide is the plan for some point a bit further in the future. But we know that Intel has this Foveros packaging technology, which we can be pretty sure works very well, up to a certain power level, as with Lakefield. We also know that, up until this point at least, we've yet to see that kind of 3D stacking used in high-performance products. Now, as I noted earlier, Xeons are generally over 150 watts, and 200 watts is not exactly uncommon. Discrete graphics? That will generally run up to 300 watts. These three FPGAs here range from 70 watts in the case of the Aria 10 to well over 100 watts in the case of the Stratix 10. Nirvana, at least, is capable of 250 watts. 
You cannot put all of this into one single 3D stacked package. So forget that idea for now where we zoom into this XPU package. And I really wish I had a higher resolution version of this, but we can see four of these XPUs. Just imagine it's the same four that we see in this slide. And presumably they'll be interchangeable, depending on which loads that you run the most. And that is basically what this XPU means. You substitute one of these X's for one of these. So you could, for example, have one Xeon XPU, and two of these could be X to the power of E graphics XPUs. And then this last one here could be a Nirvana XPU. It's basically just marketing. Outside of these XPUs appears to be, at first glance, five RAM chips. On closer inspection, I believe that these four are SRAM chips. And this is an unknown larger fifth chip in the middle, which I think still says RAM on it. And this is why I wish I had a higher resolution version of this slide. And to be honest with you, this whole thing here could just be complete nonsense. However, if so, then this is fairly specific nonsense. So these four outer chips between the XPUs looks like they are some kind of shared cache. And this fifth chip could be DRAM or Optane, or it could be some kind of IO and control die like we see with AMD's Zen 2. And outside of the package, we see four stacks of high bandwidth memory. So perhaps a better way to look at this is this whole mini package here with the four main chips and all the memory. Call this an XPU, which can have a variety of elements depending on what your requirements are. And with that in mind, I would also suggest that these HBM stacks are likely optional simply for cost reasons. And getting back to Foveros, which we saw with Lakefield, in this case, it's likely being used similarly in that each of these XPUs will require its own base die for I.O. and routing purposes. But if we assume that is the case, why then is all this memory not on top of the XPU? In the same way that we saw with Lakefield. And the answer to that is likely what I discussed. is because the TDPs of these much more powerful XPU chips, the very top layer, the cores, the graphics, it's those that need to be directly attached to the cooling, not this RAM. But obviously, regarding this, there's something far more interesting than what I just discussed. There's not only four of these XPUs, there are 16. So each individual package, say, of these four XPUs is connected to another two using Intel's EMIB, their embedded multi-die interconnect bridge. This high bandwidth silicon bridge that we've already seen utilized in their KB Lake G package, which if you remember, integrated Intel CPUs with Radeon GPUs and HBM. It goes without saying that this must be one extremely large package overall with extreme power and extreme performance too. If you consider that just one of these XPUs could possibly be a 30 plus core Xeon on 10 nanometers, then this whole thing would be approaching almost 500 cores at this level of integration. Now for the final part of this video, I'll give some analysis and my thoughts on what this all means. When I first started researching this video, I initially thought, this is extremely risky and brave of Intel to transform their portfolio and redefine Intel inside. But the reality is, the silicon will remain mostly the same. They can't really risk going all in with this XPU strategy straight off the bat, because they still make a fortune in, let's call it, normal CPUs, both in client and the data center. But with that said, at a certain level, all of these XPUs need to be able to connect to other XPUs and do it at high performance. So all of this future silicon that Intel creates, there's going to be a certain overhead to pay simply for that. And with that said, I barely even talked about graphics, even though Intel's graphics may be one of the most interesting talking points over the next few years. However, over at Tom's, we learned that Intel says it will split these graphics solutions into two distinct architectures, with both integrated and discrete graphics cards for the consumer market, client, and discrete cards for the data center. Intel also said that the cards will come wielding the 10 nanometer process and arrive in 2020. Now for me, these discrete data center cards are pretty certain to end up as these XPUs. However, that may not happen with the 10 nanometer versions discussed in the Tom's article. 
And from this slide in Murthy's presentation, we learned that Intel's first 7 nanometer product would be this X to the power of E architecture based GP GPU using Foveros for data center AI and HPC. And this launches in 2021, which, if you recall, I said was worth remembering when seen in this slide near the beginning of the video. Think about what this means though. Intel's lead 7 nanometer product will be a GPU. One of the major failings is their inability to predict where technology is going. That's why they failed so hard in mobile before, and if you remember, on 22 nanometers, they said that they'd be going mobile first, after missing that boat, and ended up launching Batrial, which cost them billions of dollars in contra revenue while they failed utterly to break into that mobile market. And they've also missed the AI boat. Nvidia and Google, among others, are way ahead there. However, it has to be said that Intel has splashed out the cash here on all this stuff in order to at least buy a lifeboat. But all of this has had a detrimental effect on their classic markets, which is the CPU, which was powering PCs and servers for decades. AMD are now well ahead, so much so that they're basically sandbagging not just in PC, but now also high-end desktop with their recent Threadripper 24 core announcement. Intel, on the other hand, they have slashed prices by nearly half for their high-end desktop, and they still barely look competitive with AMD's client PC. This stuff here is going to lose to Ryzen, let alone Threadripper, at least after the 16-core 3950X finally launches. Nobody's pointed this out yet, but Skylake X wasn't that great in gaming, and Cascade Lake won't be great either. The only thing preventing a clean kill by AMD here is pricing and availability. But as I was saying, GPU first on 7 nanometers. But this isn't about taking on AMD, it's about taking on Nvidia, who Intel sees as the larger threat. And this slide, look at the green border and the red border, these relative sizes of the circles is enough proof of what Intel considers their main rival. And again, this also shows Intel's game plan. They are offering all of this. Nvidia has only got GPU, while AMD only has CPU and GPU. Intel's game plan? It is selling all of this in the same package at the same time. And as I got deeper into the research for this video, I realised that it was impossible to convey the whole message here. Intel are just too big, and their plans are just too grandiose. I've barely even touched on what this means for the PC, which is where most of my interest lies. However, looking over these slides proclaiming the death of the PC and Intel's belief around PC loyalists while they collect record profits in a declining market, it sure makes me fear for the future of the PC. I think what's worse though is this third point which says innovation is required. Because what I've shown you from every other point in every other presentation today, it kind of made me realise that Intel has little intention of doing so, at least not for desktop CPUs. Like I said though, graphics appears to be the new darling at 7 nanometers, so that is at least a win there. Finally though, this slide I think hammers home what Intel means by PC, when they talk about enabling revolutionary new form factors which we've just seen with Lakefield and the Surface Neo. And in 2020, mobility will be redefined. For Intel, the PC really means mobile PCs. And I expect desktop CPUs to remain on the lagging edge process for the foreseeable future. All of this XPU stuff, all of it, it is way ahead of the PC. But to end this video on a positive note, which is not something I generally do with Intel, however, I always try to give credit where credit is due. And for that reason, I have to say that Lakefield does look like an impressive piece of engineering, and it is likely the most advanced CPU out there today. To be clear about Intel's current woes, all of it is self-inflicted. They milked the PC for a decade and are now paying the price, which in their case is record profitability. It's not actually Intel that's paying the price of this, it's you, and it's the OEMs who can't meet demand. And that's the price that we all pay for being so reliant on a sole supplier over this past decade. And this ongoing manufacturing issue that they've been having will surely be solved. 
They are certainly talking up 7 nanometers, and it feels different to what we were led to believe with 14 and 10. I think that they're going to figure their shit out at 7 nanometers, at which point they should be close to TSMC, at which point it becomes a matter of will and spending. Intel has very deep pockets, and it's been a long time since they've blown a few billion acquiring companies. So if they nail 7 nanometers, they can convert their fabs wholesale to that node and realise their vision of powering the world. They have everything else and they've got a bunch of stuff that nobody else has. Right, I'm done again. Difficult to analyse Intel compared to AMD. Intel are just so much larger and I don't feel quite so involved. So I think videos like these will only get better the more of them that I do. And you've probably noticed that I am doing quite a few more now on Intel. And I would do a lot more on NVIDIA if NVIDIA just did something interesting. But regarding Intel, I am starting to get quite interested in what they are doing at the technical level. And to end, as always, check out the website for some new articles. It's been a bit slow recently, but it's that slow time of year in tech, to be honest. And in fact, the next big thing will likely be X to the power of E from Intel, or maybe Zen 3. But we're six months away from simply hearing news on either of those, I fear. But in the meantime, I'm fairly certain I'll be able to dig up one or two more things that you guys find interesting. I'll catch you later, guys.